Um, I think I would like to start with our case, the concrete case of this morning, what we heard from um, the, the project in Chivaro in, in um, Namibia. Um, I think one of my strongest uh, recollections was that there is a morale in the issue of cash transfer, um, which might be part of the reason why we also heard um, Solomon Aswav talk about many stakeholders being in doubt. And that is a sort of Lutheran idea that if you don't work, you don't eat. And this, um, the people in Ochivaro are not only poor, they are what they call, it's a stigmatizing term, but dirt poor, meaning they only literally had the piece of clothing that they were wearing on their body. And by being given 100 crowns a month, they could take that additional small, small step to even begin to think about their, you know, how to better sustain their livelihood. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that, on the, on the kind of opposition and aggressiveness that have been sort of surrounding the Ochivaro uh, project, because I think there is some general learning we could do that we could discuss. Yes. Um... Ochivero is, a, is, is in many ways a very, very unique place. Um, it's, it's, um, sometimes we even have debates whether it's a, it's a village or it's an urban area. Um, in, the, in the sense that it's um, a, a typical village in Namibia would have some, some access to some um, agricultural farmland and uh, people would have a different different way of living. Ochivero is almost like a concentration camp. Um, it's, it's, it's in the corridor of a very hostile uh, commercial farmers. In fact, long before the basic income grant was piloted there, the commercial farmers actually took government to court to, to, to demolish Ochivero, to say they don't need this village here, this village must go away. It's just a a group of thieves and uh, people that are um, causing problem, problem for them. I mean, this is 1,500 Namibian citizens we, we're talking about. Many of them um, ancestral owners, actually, of the land on which those, those farmers are sitting there and that they've been working as, as farm workers, uh, many of them on those farms. So it's um, th this hostile environment between the, the community and the, the, the surrounding farmers has, has been there and has been sort of um, exacerbated by, by the implementation of this grant. What, is, what has been interesting is that a couple of uh, farmers that are actually living in this village also because it's a universal unconditional grant, a couple of those farmers which some of the villagers consider as millionaires actually registered uh, for the basic income grant. Initially, when we were paying out, they actually came and queue, stand in the queue to get this hundred hundred dollars together with with their with their farm but workers. Was, uh, could you yes. just shortly summarize what is the nature of the criticism of, of the, the grounds for the hostility against the big? Um, basically, the, the many of the farmers in the in the area feels that the um, basic income grant um, is not going to change the situation in Ochivero for the better. Mm -hmm. They think uh, people are going to misuse the money, that they're going to um, drink out the, the money spent on alcohol and, and so on. Um, but I think it's the, 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 the main thing is that they, they don't they don't see the viability of this, of this village. And therefore, with the introduction of the basic grant, they see uh, this settlement becoming a permanent viable settlement, and which, which is something that they, did, that they don't really want. But, but generally, um, they also play into the, into the words of other critics that this would, this would promote laziness uh, amongst the community, that this would um, promote dependency, that people are not going to stand up and, and work and so on. I mean, 
for starters, these people, have, most of them have been working and have been laid off from work, and almost on an every second day they are, they are out there looking for, looking for a job. So it's, it's, it's a lot of historical factors, but also uh, really looking at the, at the future viability of the, of the village and, uh, and a lot of complicated sectors, uh, factors around, around, around land reform and, and other, okay. other, other, other issues. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex setup. Um, I understand. So, so my, my thinking, my question then to Solomon as well, uh, given the example of Chivaro, would you say that pilot projects like this are sort of, sh it's difficult to draw conclusions because there's sort of shrewd circumstances surrounding a village that the a universal scheme is the only way forward? I think pilot, pilot it, uh, I think the best way, you need to pilot it before you scale up. You need to see whether that program has an impact in a very contextualized uh, area. Then based on that evidence, you then make a recommendation to scale up and you need to also kind of uh, see an ex ante kind of impact if you, if you kind of scale up. I have a little problem with the universal, uh, universal approach. I think Namibia is pretty middle income kind of country, I would say. I don't consider it like low income countries, uh, like South Africa and Brazil and so forth. We talk a lot about whether that's really feasible in a really poor countries like in Eastern and Southern African countries. Uh, so in terms of the budget and so on, uh, I, we would have a little problem with that universal approach of providing the cash for every eligible uh, eligible population. I know, uh, like uh, our president today, from human rights point of view, you could advocate that. So every time there is this tension between the economic argument and the, the rights approach argument, and you need to find an optimal way uh, to, to move forward. But, but is it realistic to have cash transfers in low-income countries? Because as you just said, many practical examples are from middle-income countries where the fertility rates already have gone down. Yes, I mean, uh, that's why the cash transfer is pretty uh, feasible. I mean, like I showed, there's a number of cash transfer program going on a number of Af uh, African countries, but they're not universal. They're targeted to the ultra poor. There could be, we might have 100,000 uh, people who could get the money, but you could afford only for half of them. So you just need to go to the top, the ultra poor, and then you provide, uh, you provide the, the cash transfer for them. Uh, if, of course, if you have the money, if there's a budget allows and, and then there is enough budget, uh, you could go for the universal. But there's every time also another, I, I mean, it's cash transfer, the only policy, an instrument that you want to pursue. With that, the same money, you might pursue alternative uh, intervention and make a greater impact. So there's every time there's uh, this way of thinking that uh, we should think. As an economist, uh, every time that's the way I think. Uh, it is good if there is a money, but every time we need to look at the cost and the benefits of all the, the designs we, we pursue. Mm. Okay, and a question to you, Shastin Jonsson. So there was a, a person here in, in the audience who said that SIDA is quite late coming into the issue of, of uh, cash transfer. How do you respond to the sort of general idea that if you don't work, you don't, you know, that we're, we're creating a new kind of dependency, having gone from maybe a dependency now to cash transfer dependency. What is CEDA's position on this? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we have a, a very clear position on this. Maybe I can elaborate a little bit from, from my own perspective. And um, I, I also um, reacted very strongly on this laziness because I, I cannot avoid from, from referring to our own system here in Sweden. and. Uh, the Barnbidrag, the social protection system that has been existing for every, well, in the beginning, not for everyone, but for several years. Uh, for all children. For, for exactly, for mm -hmm. the children being paid in the beginning to, to the mothers. That has actually um, saved many, many families from, from poverty. And I also think that um, cash transfers also can be, I mean, there are, um, there, there is cash transfer in a, a development context, but it's also a, a very important um, way to work link, uh, when, when we're looking at the humanitarian context. And in order to, to actually decrease the humanitarian caseload and, and uh, a little bit um, um, increase the dignity of people and, and make them have some hope in the future, I think that the cash transfers are very important. 
and um, it, ha it is not, uh, as you, you, you refer to CEDA being late on cash transfers, I would say that in the humanitarian context CEDA is not late, but maybe we are now starting to look at what, what are the possibilities to, to work in the future. And but do you agree with Kate Donald said, if I understood you correctly, that this is sort of the way forward after 2015, that this, is, this will be a new large focus? Actually, I noted down her conclusion because <laughs> I think it is, I think, yes, this is something for the future. And yeah. it's something that I, we, will, we will probably lift from our work in the, the resilience group. Mm. That we are now, we have the, pos we have the possibility to, to propose an approach on how CEDA could work with increasing resilience and, and uh, disaster risk reduction and also the, the, mani the po possibility to, to cope with crisis and then cash transfer I would suggest would be one, one um, factor or one way of working, one tool. But we also heard Solomon Asfar say that uh, it needs to be donor driven, if I understood you correctly, that there is very little willingness um, to sort of build it from within. I mean, I read the African Economic Outlook was saying that if cash transfers are to succeed, it's completely dependent on political leaders in Africa and their ability to have the emerging uh, middle class pay tax to increase the willingness for a robust tax system. So are you seeing this as sort of donor driven in the future, the cash transfers, or would CEDA be um, involving themselves in encouraging domestic financing? <laughs> I think this question is even much bigger than cash transfers. You, you just said that um, in order for cash transfer to succeed, it's, it's important to have uh, committed political will. And I mean, that is for the whole development of, of Africa or the, the, the developing countries. The whole, if, it's going to, if development is going to succeed, it's dependent on, on political will in the particular countries and the governments. Uh, I would not believe, and, and this is was one of my questions actually to, to the Namibian colleague, uh, where the, the example from, from cash transfers increasing uh, education or enrollment in school and the need for clinics, but is the government uh, capable of keeping track of, uh, of having teachers, having clinics, etc.? That is, I, I would say it's... Um, there will be a need for donors, yes, but the, the political will and the, the political will also to, to contribute with taxes is, is crucial. Okay. Do you want to answer that question? Yeah. The, the government has, has made uh, good progress in providing uh, basic services, uh, setting up a clinic, uh, building a school, in, in, in also in most remote areas. The, the, the question is access to those services because you still have to pay school fees, you still have to pay for a, for a clinic fee. So we, um, there is of course a parallel campaign to say um, there must be free education, there must be free health care. But in the absence of that, um, uh, those poor people need to be assisted to be able to access those services. So um, uh, relatively the, the provision of those services are, are, are in place. Um, but still it's not accessible to, to uh, many poor people that, that don't have a livelihood, uh, that don't have an income to be able to pay for those services. Some of them, the amounts look very small, but for poor people it's still not accessible. But you had a calculation that it was, I think, 5.7% of GDP of Namibia that would be needed for a universal uh, basic income grant scheme. Have you in your coalition have any opinions on whether it should be, it can be donor driven as it is in the case in Ochivaro, or, or do you feel that it actually there is a point and that it should be taken sort of from Namibia's own money? Yeah, we, we, I think we, 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 we're trying to avoid this uh, one size fits all kind of an, an approach. In our context, in the Namibian context, looking at our available resources and so on, we feel and we, we, we strongly are of the opinion that this can be financed locally, domestically. We would probably need uh, donor support is maybe with, with the setting up of the system, with the registration process, getting the system going and so on. But in terms of um, sustaining, in terms of keeping the, the, the grants going, we feel we, we have enough resources to be able to, to, to sustain that. And we would, we would really, um, we would also see this as an approach to equalize our society. 
We have a small group of people which is filthy rich, well off, and then the majority uh, on the receiving end. We, and we see this as a means to equalize our society as well. Mm. A question to you, Kate. You very pointedly said that social protection is not an option. You said it's an obligation under international law. But social protection is not the same thing as cash transfers, right? So I was a bit surprised that you, given all the sort of criticisms you had, you sort of landed in a sort of embracing the idea. So my criticism is not of cash transfers at all. I think cash transfers... Or the weaknesses or the possible... Yes, but I, what I was trying to say is that they have to be... You have to be very careful about how you implement them in order to ensure that, that by mistake, you're not excluding people, you're not violating people's human rights in the way in which you go about putting them in place or the way in which you choose the beneficiaries. So, of course, cash transfer and social protection aren't the same. Social protection is much bigger than just cash transfer programs. Um, but I would say that, I mean, there are a number of human rights obligations that are relevant to the discussion we're having. And, of course, human rights aren't a panacea at all. We all know that human rights have huge, huge problems of implementation. And a lot of the UN human rights mechanisms are fairly toothless. But in terms of international law, there is, you know, it, it is every government has um, the duty to ensure the right to social security of all its citizens and it has the duty to ensure that they can enjoy an adequate standard of living. How you define an adequate standard of living is obviously an important question and a difficult one but that, that obligation does exist and I would also say in terms of, um, in terms of accountability we, uh, the discussion we're having just now about whether it should be donor driven or government driven I'd say that donor-driven programs, although, of course, in the, at the initial stages and in terms of their results can be excellent, I think in, ter in, in terms of accountability, there are some issues in that, you know, the beneficiaries don't necessarily know who, it, who is accountable for these programs. Um, there's also um, the fact that they can be seen as instruments of charity rather than entitlements, whereas social protection should be seen as an entitlement rather than kind of a, a gesture of goodwill, for example. And I would also say that in terms of governments being able to afford it or not being able to afford it, of course there are resource constraints. Of course there are huge resource constraints in many states. But a lot of the time it is a question of political will and prioritization and alloca allocation of resources. And very often that's not done in the most appropriate way to ensure the human rights of the people living in that country are upheld. But if, if you had a choice between, let's say, in, in order if we're all in agreement that, you know, resilience and increased prosperity is the goal, uh, if you had a choice between cash transfers who are sort of universal and, let's say, something targeted towards women of the household, of, you know, may, maybe microloans, uh, etc., what would be your choice? Of course, if it's, a choice between, if it's a choice between no cash transfers at all and targeted cash transfer programs, I or any human rights person would say of course targeted programs are a good start and they're better than nothing but you have to be very careful in how you target them um, I think generally you should ensure that if targeting is necessary it is kind of as categorical as possible so it's for example all people over a certain age or all people under a certain age or because otherwise you have kind of very fine lines and you have real problems of exclusion and discrimination but of course targeting is a necessary approach in many circumstances but my point is that it should be looked at as a, as a path towards universal coverage, hopefully. Mm. There's also the, the risk of, of corruption and malpractice. And my question is, is, is the risk larger when we're dealing with those kind of cash transfer systems or compared to, let's say, infrastructure development or more sort of uh, traditional donor aid programs. Uh, what, what, what's been your experience? Uh, I think when, when, when one makes it universal and, um, uh, and, and universal is not, it's not really just in terms of covering the whole population, everyone, but universal could be all children, for example, a, a universal coverage for all children. I think that really helps to um, with, with those issues of corruption and other, because uh, it's, it's every child of a certain age is entitled, and it really leaves out the, the, the issues of corruption. When you have issues like means testing and really determining who is poor, I mean, you, you, you literally have to, to almost 
treat individuals case by case basis. I mean, we were in Geneva last year at a meeting of the special rapporteur, and uh, there we were getting cases from, from Brazil, for example, where people empty their houses when somebody has to go out to, to register them for a ben certain benefit. And when the assessment officers comes after a month, this house is a fridge, is a satellite TV, everything. So um, it's, 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 really, it's really very difficult. And also, you know, in, in, in rural setup, you, you have to really nail down how many cattle does this household own or in this household, um, what, what is the, what is the, it, it's, it's a very costly, it's a very, time-consuming exercise to be able to really determine and, and means testing is, is, is a very costly exercise. We've looked at various examples from Latin America in Africa and so on, but it's a very, so where, where I think we can, we can afford and the resources are available, we would like to encourage that we, that we go for, um, for, 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 for universal and, and the means testing, sometimes people have to bribe, like in South Africa there's many cases where uh, people have to bribe public servants to be put on those schemes, and it really avoids those kind of scenarios when you have a universal system which is open and transparent to everyone. But there is discussion in Sweden whether it's reasonable, like the children allowance is given to everyone, irregardless of income. And I, I know of people who, I mean not myself, but people who have had really good income, who have saved all the children allowance up till the age of 18, and then they give the, their kids money so they can go traveling the world. I mean, that is how it's used. I mean, is that, I mean, this is a loaded question, but would you, is that maybe a mistake we're doing in this country that you could avoid? Well, we, we, I, I would, for example, the, our old age pension, um, we, we, or, or, or other, other schemes that we have, when we feel that the tax system could, can be designed more effectively to be able to take more from the wealthy, so that even if, even if they, even if they benefit from, from a grant still, because they are paying more tax, they would be, that, that would be sort of be, be balanced out in, in, another in a way. way. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Salaman Ashwa, what is your thinking about uh, the corruption I, risk? You, uh, there is no evidence that cash transfer program uh, increased corruption. There is uh, no evidence? There is no evidence. I, okay. I did not see, even in some evidence, they said there is, uh, it minimizes uh, corruption. Compared to other uh, very big infrastructure projects in terms of tendering and so on, there is a lot of room to... Uh, for the bureaucratics to look for rent seeking. Uh, having said that, just let me give, to give a very balanced picture so that uh, about this main testing, targeting, and so on. Uh, I'll, if you look at the broader picture, except Namibia, if you look at the African setting, all the cash transfer program that I showed before, the targeting structure most of the time is like proxy means testing and, and community targeting. The banks push that idea, the World Bank Social Protection, they use a lot of proxy means in testing to target the, I mean, there's a lot of limitation. I'm not saying that's the, an ideal way. But there's a lot of pros to that. There's a lot of advantage of pushing that methodology in terms of finding out which families do really qualify for this cash transfer. Because when you have a limited resource, if you go subjectively, it's very, you are very prone to excluding those who should be including. So the objective of proxy means testing is just to really figure out who are really poor, who deserve this cash. Uh, so I know I, can, I agree with you, there is a problem with that idea, but uh, to my knowledge, the existing method we have in terms of figuring out the pool, uh, I think these are uh, the, the method. Universal is an ideal way, the resource, but that's not realistic in most of the poor countries to push for everybody who qualified to get the cash. Namibia, they could afford, I agree with, the, with them, they could allocate 6% of their GDP, they have good resource, they could push so it varies from country to country, just to, to throw that, uh, throw that uh, balance it. Mm. it it's six percent of national budget, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's budget, what yeah. I saw you had. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, one question from uh, Fushartin Jonsson, and then uh, if you want to ask questions, I, I will uh, open the floor. Um, now with your experience from, from Africa, I want to know, Shastin, how realistic do you think is to argue in a political context in African countries that human rights and rights-based approach um, are sort of the reasons um, to look at cash transfers as a, a, a way forward. I mean, we've heard that those are two strong reasons too, but how, how easy a sell will it be? <laughs> 
Actually, I, I would like to take another, other, an example <coughs> from, uh, from my own experience on another topic, and that may, um, may, that may not be an answer, but it, it is a, a little bit explaining how tricky the, the rights-based approach is sometimes and how, how it may be clear in our minds but not necessarily in the context mm -hmm. where we're working in Africa. That was actually when I was working in Mali and we were having a discussion within the, the embassy team about female genital mutilation and uh, the rights-based approach. And it was very clear to us during this discussion that talking about rights-based was not the way to get forward. But when we were, talk, we were, when we were um, connecting this discussion to the, the health of the, the young, young girls, we could reach through and get a message, get through the message. Um, and I, I'm, uh, we need to argue the rights-based approach because it is, the, it's, it, it is the, the, the obligation of the government to, to take care of the rights of the people. But um, maybe that might, we will may not be able to come through to, to ordinary people with the, this approach. So your answer is, in short, no. <laughs> uh, it but what could, It's but, not so easy. There is no, no, I nothing understand. like I yes understand. and no. But what would be an innovative, uh, innovative way of sort of approaching it? I mean, um, Uhura, I mean, maybe you should answer that. Do you agree that, do you agree with Chastin that this is maybe not the strongest no, we, we no, we we, we find uh, we find the human rights approach to be to be to be powerful. I mean, for example, the 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 recent adoption of that recommendation by the ILO really uh, forces government uh, to engage in a discussion mm -hmm. with trade unions, with with other social actors to say, okay, how do we how do we move forward at the, at the minimum level? How do we begin to include? other groups that are not covered by our, our, our social welfare programs at the moment. And um, 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 we, as we in civil society outside of government can uh, hold government accountable to say, you have put, as a nation, you have committed ourselves to, to these uh, instruments, international instruments and, and conventions and so on. And at least at a minimum level, government needs to needs to go ahead and, and act. So the, the human rights approach and the instruments, human rights instruments are a very powerful lobbying tool for us as churches and, and civil society to be able to hold our government accountable and also to, 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 to argue um, in terms of really moving forward to mobilize additional resources. For example, last year um, government introduced very, very moderate uh, increases in taxes on mining and we had, we had the most hostile uh, and very intimidating, aggressive response from the mining houses, saying even to our government, if you don't, by Thursday, 2 o'clock, withdraw those proposals for mining, new investments in mining will be closed down, uh, some mines might even close up and so on, which, uh, which was really um, a, an uncalled for in intimidation on and on a sovereign, sovereign government. But when you have that, that kind of an approach, government can even go to those uh, other actors and say, but we have an obligation, legal obligation as a government to at least meet the basic needs of our citizens. Mm. And, and also to show that in the absence of such interventions, we cannot guarantee peace and stability in this country because an absence of war is not only, it's not only peace. If you don't meet people's basic needs, that's really a breeding ground for conflict and, and unrest yeah. in, in the country. Mm. Mm. Of course. Mm. Um, questions, please? Okay, several. You're first. Can you please introduce yourself? My name, my name is Melinda Sundell, and I work at Siani, the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, adding on to your how to sell it, whether to sell it human rights or to sell it economic, I think that your presentation, which I enjoyed tremendously, I'm also an economist, naturally, I thought it was great, <laughs> um, but it, it, it puts to bed the need for this kind of argument. Why, why just, we can sell it with whatever goes. Uh, and I thought that was sort of the beauty of your livelihood approach and the way that you, you showed the increase in value from the $1 to the $1.50 in the local economy, that, that there is no argument we can't afford it. 
it's a very efficient form of investment. And therefore, whether you sell it as human rights, which I think a lot of people really do understand, uh, or you sell it as we can afford this, it's, it's economically viable, who, you know, why bother? We can sell it both ways. So I just, I was thinking that it was, uh, sorry, that wasn't a question. But <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> just a remark. And I thought, I think the combination of the panel is excellent for illuminating all of these different, mm. uh, congratulations to Madeline or whoever <laughs> organized, organized it. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, is the gentleman in the beige jacket? Yeah, Hans Eriksson is my name. One question to, to Shestin. Uh, I know SIDA is starting a, a new important support to Li Liberia in, eco in the agricultural sector uh, based on market, making market works for the poor and, and, and supporting different uh, su supply chain. Uh, as Liberia is an other of the African very unequal countries, which even has caused an, an civil war until quite re recently. Is this cash transfer part of, of, of a strategy to, to improve the rural livelihood? Uh, and another question to, to, to Solomon. When you look for evidence in your impact uh, uh, studies, can you say if it's uh, a better impact, if it's conditional or unconditional grants yeah. mm. or uh, who takes most benefit from this uh, cash transfer is it what you can call the extreme poor the medium poor or, or if you differentiate among the, the these thank you groups I think we thank you very much thank you <laughs> uh, Shastin would you like to start um, yes I I would say not that I know about that the cash transfer would be part of that of the of the strategy, but uh, I would, should I just I was in contact with with the person in charge of this um, uh, value chain mar making markets for m making markets work for the poor program, and it it is still in its writing and it's in its start up pos position. So, not that I know about cash transfer in Liberia. Do you think it has potential in Liberia? Well, <laughs> maybe there is room for that. Okay. Uh, Solomon, we have many questions, so please. Yeah, okay. Just briefly, uh, just to comment on one, what she said, I think it's very important to use a smart argument wherever we go. I, I know like in Southern Africa, the right to approach argument could make the case. In South Africa and Namibia, that is very compelling. If we go to Eastern South, uh, West Africa, it might not be. So the economic argument could make this. Okay, so it all depends where we go, which one is effective we, we could use. We never uh, did any analysis comparing conditionality versus unconditionality, cash transfer. But the World Bank did once in Tanzania. As you know, the bank oftentimes they push the conditional cash transfer. Uh, not to criticize the old bank, but uh, they want to bring the Latin America, American experience to Africa. So they every time try to make the case that condi conditional is better than unconditional. But in FAO, we did not do any analysis on that. As to the heterogeneity of the impact, the, this distributional impact across different age groups, let me give you one example we did in Kenya. The Kenya cash transfer program is a flat transfer. They give like $20 for a family, and the, every month they get $20, $20, regardless of the size of the, the, size of the household. So what do you, when you could expect it, then the impact could vary according to the household size. Those families with a lesser household size would use much more of the money to reinvest. And we did the analysis ac across the median household size. So we, we saw the impact on consumption, on productive assets to be higher among the families with smaller household size. So we, we do a lot of analysis because if you don't see a positive impact, on average, it doesn't mean that there is no impact. If you break it down across different uh, wealth category, across different age, household size, and you could see uh, more impact. So we do, we do that. I cannot just definitely give you one answer, but we do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Sten Rylander, I'm a half Namibian in retirement here in Sweden. Um, I was overwhelmed by the, the very concrete positive results coming out of the Ochivero pilot project and it would be so good if 
this could be scaled up and rolled out on a national level in Namibia. Also taking into consideration that you would be able to finance this nationally without major donor involvement. It would give you a pretty strong hand, I would guess, in, in your dialogue with the national leadership. But I also notice that the, the leadership is divided. You have some strong, for, strong guys on your side, like the Minister of Trade and Industry, Hage Gengob, who is also a presidential candidate. But the president and the prime minister seem to be against it. Is it, in your view, has it, uh, what Erika alluded to, a cultural background that they are caught up in a conservative kind of Lutheran thinking that you shouldn't give money to lazy people or so? Or is there hope that a, a new emerging younger leadership would buy these very strong arguments more easily than the old ones? Please, you can. Oh, yeah. Answer. yeah. Um, yeah, we, we um, the, 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 the Prime Minister, for example, uh, is said he's open for a discussion on, on conditional grants. He doesn't believe in, in, in universal grants. The, the President um, seems to be not at all for any grants. He's, he's really stuck in this, uh, in this belief that um, 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 one has to sweat to be able to, to, to gain something. Although, of course, the president is a beneficiary of the, of the War Veterans Grant, <laughs> although he's very well off and is, is a, is a well-paid civil servant, but he's, he's, a, he's, he's having a different view on that one. Um, um, I think there is, there, is a, there is an emerging uh, concern uh, for inclusivity, that uh, we, need, uh, we need a better Namibia where at least everybody's basic needs are being met. Um, we, we have very, very strong differences in terms of how do we, how do we realize that, uh, that, that inclusivity and, and breaching that gap between, between the rich and the, and the poor. But I think there is, there is, there is growing um, consensus that um, something urgent needs to be done about the inequality and the, the, the situation in, in Namibia. I mean, if you have 6,000 innocent children dying every day of child malnutrition in a, in a country that is so, so blessed with resources, that's a situation that is unacceptable. Um, in fact, today and, and tomorrow and, 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 and the days to come, there's a policy conference of the ruling party, the first of its kind um, after independence, and we are hoping that the leadership will emerge with some kind of a consensus uh, in terms of uh, what urgently needs to be done to, 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 to address the, the situation. It's really shameful that we, we, we have not made progress uh, in meeting the, the very basic needs of, of, of the population. Um, we, we are hoping that, of course, the, the presidential candidate that is supporting the basic income grant Images Victoria is, and it will make our, our work a lot more easier. We don't really expect a universal grant, but more maybe a, a, at least for, for children and the unemployed, there might be a, a universal grant, grant coming up if that's the case. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, and I would like my panelists to think of a closing remark. And my question to you is the following. You are our experts here today. I want to know what one thought do you bring with you from here today? Like when you go back, you'll say, hmm, guess what I heard in Stockholm, or I hadn't thought about this before. You understand? Great, thanks. Question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Uhuru. Uh, you are from the Evangelic Lutheran Church. And as we who know about religion know what Martin Luther said, sola gratia, which means grace alone. And that's a found of the Lutheran faith. So I'm not uh, amazed or, or uh, confused that the Lutheran church is doing this because it's about grace and forgiveness, the leading idea of the Lutheran faith. But um, how much of, of the... So it's wrong to blame Luther because he was in the opposite. Give to help people and forgive those who have done wrong and all things. So 
I, I would like to know how much of the money now comes from Namibia and uh, the, how much from abroad? You mean for the pilot project? Yes. Yeah, what you are. Or if you have some plan in the future or building up something. And, uh, yeah, well, we've, we've, we've all, even with the fundraising for the pilot project, we've always emphasized the need for Namibians to contribute um, financially to the pilot because we, we really, the, 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 the proposal from the NAMTEX Commission is based on Namibians caring for fellow, fellow Namibians, that um, those paying taxes, um, it will be taken from them and those that are unemployed, that are less fortunate, would be, would be helped so that they can improve their, their condition. So we've, we've really emphasized and have um, launched uh, uh, campaigns to be able to raise funds locally as well. We, we have so far uh, received more of the funds from, from outside. Uh, the, the initial boost, the funding has been, has been quite substantial, but that initial boost of funds has now, has now dried up and we are, we are looking for, for additional funds and for that we are really looking at uh, aggressive local fundraising. For example, we have now permission from the postal services to be able to use all their postal boxes to write appeal letters to Namibians to say, can you adopt one villager from Ochivero? Because we have about 1,000 people in Ochivero. If you can adopt one villager to maybe pay their grant for, um, for two years, that would be like 100 Namibian dollars per month that you put aside from your income. So that's the kind of campaigns that, that we are encouraging. So far it has been more monies from outside, but uh, we want to emphasize that Namibians must take care of fellow Namibians, and we have enough resources in the country to, to facilitate Germany that. contributed a lot, right? German yes, church. Substantially, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Quick closing remarks, and then we have a uh, dill marinated pike perch in tomato waiting for us. <laughs> Please, Kate. Excellent. So I think the main thing that I'll take away from today is obviously this is something that I've come at from a very human rights angle throughout the time that I've been working on social protection and cash transfers. And I think what I really, I'll really take away from today is the really diverse effects that cash transfer programs can have, diverse and widespread positive effects. I've, I've learned a lot from, from all of these presentations. So, and I think as well the, the link between the kind of twin um, issues of stigmatization and empowerment and how cash transfer programs can really work from turning one into the other. Yeah, thanks. Um, there, there are two, two, two lessons. One is the, um, the, 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 the substantial economic benefit. I think there's, there's been that awareness, but I think the, the presentation by Solomon really, really brought out very strong arguments from, a, from an economic perspective why we need a, a, a basic income. It's not only for survival, but it's also for really growing the economy and, and creating more opportunities. But secondly, also, um, having spoken to a number of people in Sweden since I come here, I, I always admired the Scandinavian model or, or in, in countries like Sweden, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear that uh, social protection uh, programs, the kind of social welfare that is in the country has also facilitated the, and ensured that uh, not a majority of people are left out, but the society sort of grows together and there's less inequality in, in a country like Sweden, and, and that's, a, that's an inspiration I will, I will be going back with. Thank you so much. Salomon. Uh, just one thing I take away is uh, the opposite of kids. Uh, I learned a lot about the human rights angle. <laughs> I'm an economist, so I... <laughs> Oh, sorry. So I did, I did learn something about the human rights perspective to make this case. Uh, I think that for the future task, what I would think is to try to bring these two together and to kind of have a very yeah. common argument, because we could contradict. If I and Kate sit together, we could debate a lot, and we could talk opposite language. Uh, so that could be like for the future, I would say, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many things have been said, but I also would like to refer to, to Solomon's presentation and uh, that the cash transfers uh, are so meaningful not only for the bene direct beneficiaries but for the whole communities and, and that it's important to see about the, uh, an overall effect of the cash transfers. And the second thing that 
cash transfers should not seen as uh, should not be seen as a standalone activity, but uh, could be fruitfully combined with with uh, agri agriculture support or market development support. Okay, thank you so much. I think we should give our panel an applaud.